Um, I'm Jim Grant. Um, if you haven't heard that already, uh, I own digital, uh, a digital marketing agency called Simply Creative Media. Uh, we're nine years old last month. Um, these slides are from November, so they say Global Entrepreneur Week, so I'm breaking another rule and bringing in slides with somebody else's logo on them, so ignore that. Who, um, any expectations about what you want to get out of security today? Anybody? Are we doing what we need to do? Yeah. Any security experts in here? Yeah, there's one. <laughs> Should be. So, um, so my intent um, is not to dig too crazy deep into security on WordPress because it's simpler um, than it looks. There's a lot of things you can do that if you do and they're best practices and practice them regularly, um, you won't have an issue. Um, there's a lot of what I consider kind of overkill and sometimes even bad advice going around about, about securing WordPress websites. Why, why should I um, secure my website? Obviously, um, you don't want it to get hacked. Um, confidentiality, that's a big one now. You see every other day on the news, somebody's data has been lost somewhere. So if you're storing any data on your website, in the database, um, even contact forms where you're collecting people's address, phone number, things like that, you have a responsibility um, to keep that information confidential. Um, integrity. Um, I don't think a lot of people think about that, but you have a responsibility to um, protect people's data. <coughs> And also, as we talk about the ways a site can be infected um, and what they might do that's malicious, um, your integrity is on the line if people are coming to your website and getting infected or um, things that, that can happen. Um, and availability. So obviously, um, I hope you're checking your website you know, regularly or running some kind of monitor to make sure it's up. Um, but you, know, you don't want to come in two months later and realize you know, your shop's been offline for three weeks and you didn't know why you didn't have any sales coming in. Anybody seen this guy sitting in a coffee shop? <laughs> He's always in the corner. Um, why does a hacker bother with me? So why does a hacker want to even hack my website? Um, it's usually about the dollar signs. Um, so they're either going to convert your site to put their content up there um, Link injection, links to their own sites. Um, that could be affiliate links, it could be just links because they want traffic, all kinds of reasons they might want to link. Um, hacktivism, that's where you get, you know, hacked by ISIS or something like that where they're trying to promote their organization. Um, Drive-by downloads, that's one of those integrity things. You don't want people coming to your website and um, getting a bad payload from your website. Uh, malicious redirects, redirecting to wherever. Viagra sites is the most popular, I think. Um, hidden pages. Um, I run across this a lot. Um, yeah, do you know you have 600 extra pages on your website? <laughs> uh, no, really? Yeah, they're all Adidas tennis shoes or something, so that happens. Um, and email spam. So a lot of people make a lot of money because they take over your email server and email from your website for a while until it gets blacklisted. Uh, but they're spamming people using your email server and your volume um, to promote their, uh, uh, their spam. <coughs> and uh, lately, uh, since I'm really into cryptocurrency lately, um, they might even put a payload on their website to use your server to mine cryptocurrency somewhere. So it's all about the dollars usually. And a lot of it is robotic, so it's not like that guy is sitting in the corner working on your website. Um, they're usually exploiting things that are known vulnerabilities with robots, software robots that try and log into your website, look for that hole in the database, or something you haven't updated to try and get into your website. So these are the three main uh, areas where the weaknesses are. Leaked passwords, um, software vulnerabilities, and your hosting. So we're just going to go through those. Um, so leaked passwords, public Wi-Fi. Um, who's still working at Who's working at the coffee shop? A couple days a week, still. Yeah. 
maybe more sometimes. Uh, Panera almost put a plaque on a table for me for a few years uh, as uh, my business location. So when you're on public Wi-Fi, if you're not connecting, this used to be a big deal when I first started doing a lot of social media. You know, Facebook wasn't even HTTPS, and if uh, you were on an open Wi-Fi at <coughs> Panera or Starbucks and um, <laughs> logging into your Facebook, people could see you logging into your Facebook and get your name and password, uh, your user ID and password. Um, so think about when you're out in public at Kaufman, <laughs> wherever it is, um, you're potentially uh, in the clear, depending on what you're connecting to and whether it's secure. Um, we actually had, I think it was two years ago here at WordCamp, somebody with, here with another conference had some malware on their machine that was bringing down the whole network because it was hammering every PC, phone, anything it could get to in the, in the venue to see if it could find uh, something to hack. Um, social engineering, this is the biggest one I see. Um, my mother gets social engineered all the time from India to fix her windows. <laughs> uh, but that's the most common way um, uh, people get into your system. Um, I, I literally have a, a friend who lost $40,000 in a cryptocurrency account because he just wasn't thinking about it one day when the people that said they were from uh, the, the uh, exchange that he was on um, and their email had been hacked, so they emailed as the exchange and said, hey, we need your private key for this. And he didn't even think about it, sent it off, and $40,000 out of his account. No time. Yeah, social engineering. Um, sending passwords in the clear. I, I, I maybe shouldn't even tell this story. Well, I'll use anonymous stories. But someplace we're going for a party this week <laughs> at WordCamp, you know, I called out and talked to the the venue manager and he's like, yeah, email over your credit card information so we can put the deposit down. I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, so think about, um, usually I don't make clients go through too much trouble, but if I need their email, um, password, user ID, I'll say, well, you know, tell me your, your user ID, text me your password, you know, or some combination. That's not best case. There are actually some good um, websites where you can pass those securely if you're dealing with people's um, logins. Um, software vulnerabilities. Um, plugins. Even the inactive. I'm asking the expert to correct me if I'm wrong, Pippin. That's still true, right? So, yeah. Um, even if you've got, you know, when you're building a site and you're messing around, experimenting with different plugins, got all 50 of Pippin's plugins on there, um, and you decided not to use 49 of them, uh, remove them. Because uh, over time, if they have a vulnerability that's discovered, uh, they may still be able to get in. Same with themes also. Don't leave inactive themes on your website unless you're going to keep them updated. And even then, uh, why leave them if it's just another uh, opportunity uh, to encounter a vulnerability along the way? Uh, the WordPress core. We can't do a lot about that one um, except report things that we find um, that may be wrong with the actual WordPress code itself. I will say the last four or five years has been, uh, aside from one or two things that have come along, it's been very secure. Um, your hosting. So hosting can be a big deal. How, how many put their website on a shared hosting account? So I do. I even put clients on shared hosting, depending on what they're paying. <laughs> so uh, it's not a bad thing, but um, and from company to company, it varies greatly, even um, from account to account. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on the big one and their sponsor. <laughs> you take a GoDaddy who's been in business a long time. They have multiple platforms and legacy platforms and they're always evolving. Uh, you may be on an old server that may not have um, you know, all the latest updates um, and so forth. So even the, the big guys, um, Yes. So, uh, posts like that, for example, GoDaddy, Bluehost, if, say, for example, you know, PHP 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, minimal requirement is 5.6 for PHP. Uh, they will not, no longer tell you, no, they cannot upgrade you. They, you, All you have to do is ask for <coughs> support, and they will upgrade you. If you're on your accounts, you should probably have a section, if you have the cPanel type on GoDaddy or in Bluehost, 
Yeah, most of the C panels now allow you to set the PHP version. Yeah. Usually, and also if you don't know, a lot of times some of your plugins these days will have a little nag notice and tell you, hey, you're not on this one and our plugin requires this. And that's when you know you need to reach out to your host. However, on the hosting, you have to be careful going back to passwords. We just had a hack last week at WP Fix It that we were cleaning where everything else was, they did have some malware on the website, a few other things happened, but they had a section on the website where they were using the actual advanced uh, MX records and their cPanel. Somebody had pointed a, or did wildcard domains and pointed that to a different server somewhere else, which is possible to do so. They were totally, and it was for phishing and they masked email. That when it was discovered by the host that there was mass emailing going on for phishing for a subdomain that and this was even hosted on the same host. So we had to track down where it was coming from. It, it was we were like, where is this at? Where was this at? And we found it right there. So you have if you ever have something like that, you can't find it. You might want to look in your MX records and see what's going on. So SSL, we talked about who works from a coffee shop. So you should, um, for your own website, and this is becoming best practice now just because Google likes it too, um, have an SSL certificate for your website and run it encrypted. Um, so there's two sides to that coin. One, everybody thinks it's really hot and important right now because Google wants it. Well, that's, that's important. Um, if you don't have a contact form or anything on your website, there's not um, necessarily a lot of risk of data or people putting in you know their phone number and getting it stolen that kind of thing um, but most um, I think most hosts now I think there's a few um, I, I had a client on HostGator last week and I don't think they were offering Let's Encrypt yet um, but that's the free ones so everybody know about Let's Encrypt so it, it's a consortium of companies I think um, I'm trying to remember who led that but uh, large IT companies um, CA, I think, is in there, and a bunch of uh, uh, to offer free certificates. Um, I was going to make a comment. Yeah, on encrypt. Uh, it's a phenomenal service. Um, every now and then, you might want to be careful with it, depending on what your site is. If you're running an e-commerce site, yeah, let's encrypt may not be your best option. Yeah. Um, only because the certificates you get don't always. Um, meet all validation requirements for really strict e-commerce rules. Uh, so yeah. We have a lot of problems with customers that use Let's Encrypt where their merchant processors, say Authorize.net, to check out or something like that, they won't they won't consider it valid even though it is valid. Right. Um, so if you are if you're running a business like an e-commerce business that makes money through e-commerce, spend money on your SSL certificate. Yeah. If you just want an SSL certificate, Let's Encrypt is yeah, so let's actually, I don't, yeah, I don't, maybe I took this slide out because of the time frame last time. Uh, Question? Is that a PCI compliance requirement? I have no idea. Oh, what well, you, so, I, I'll give you my spin on what and why too is, um, so there's multiple levels of SSL certificates. Um, basically, the Let's Encrypt certificates basically check to see if you're the owner of the domain. Um, I know on my hosting uh, data center that I use, um, every time I spin up a new account or site, they automatically, the certificate's there. But it takes about five hours or so for that verification to happen. And that's really the only verification that happens. So then you get up kind of the top of the chain is um, a company verified and you go through a whole process of proving who you are and you go back and forth with the certificate company. Um, and you can even get your name, you know, up there in the uh, uh, in the URL bar, it says, you know, this is simply creative media and it's secure. Um, so that's very verified and you can be sure of who it is. Um, and then, as for cost, um, what you're paying for when you buy certificates is insurance. So when you uh, have an e-commerce site, you know, it's a good idea to look at, you know, I'm, I'm paying 50 bucks. Am I getting, you know, how much liability coverage basically comes with that certificate and so forth. So that's, that's kind of what you're paying for that you don't get at all with this, uh, Let's Encrypt. Um, so yeah, I, uh, as a best practice, I don't, uh, I didn't know that you get turned down, but I always recommend to clients that uh, if they're doing shopping cart 
that they buy a certificate. So um, SSLs.com is one of those places you can do that fairly inexpensively too. Any other questions about certificates? Everybody's got one? Using one? Get on it. Um, so this is just a little, I, I threw in a few techie tips. This one, you know, this whole thing wasn't uh, to be too techie, but in your wp-config.php, you can add this statement, force SSL, um, admin, and uh, what that does, um, is disables um, some of the admin functionality, like getting to the editor, um, so that uh, if someone hacks in, uh, well, let's say they do a simple hack. They figured out your, net, your user ID and password, and they got in as an admin. Um, if they can get to the editor, they can now get to all your files. Um, so that's a way to turn that off. Um, use a VPN. Does anybody use a VPN? Besides anything like downloading movies and stuff? <laughs> okay. Um, we're trying to get Netflix in Europe. Or, yeah. Um, avoid shared or public computers. So I just logged in on this computer to my Google account. Eh, yeah. Maybe not a great idea. We're all weak. Um, use secure passwords. So. There's been some really awesome articles out lately about the latest study on, um, you know, that you see these publish the top 50 passwords um, that people use and that kind of thing. But it's really interesting that now the, the, with artificial intelligence and the bots, they can um, amazingly guess where people will capitalize letters and things like that. So just, you know, doing caps and lowercase and even sequences of numbers and things that you think are secure um, you don't know that you're actually thinking like everybody else <laughs> and the bots can figure a lot of that out. So I, I definitely have started recommending even though for many years I had the same password on everything, um, that you start to use a password manager, let it pick those big hairy, you know, 16 character with parens and everything else in there, um, at least 12 characters long, uh, which is more secure, 16 S's or three characters that of your choosing upper lowercase or numerals 16 s's <laughs> it takes the bots longer to figure that out um, than it does a shorter simpler password um, use different passwords everywhere get a password manager um, limit your admins I can't tell you how many sites I take over for maintenance um, or they've been hacked I do about I don't know a dozen sites a year that uh, disinfect and restore um, you know and they got 30 admins in there or they got every admin from every web person they ever worked with <laughs> um, uh, amazing um, and don't use the user ID admin um, if you're using a great password it's still secure but admins the first one the bots are gonna try so they're already one step ahead one less thing for them to guess Um, LastPass is probably the most popular and best. I use the Chrome browser password manager. Um, not the best solution, but easy. One password is if you're a purely Apple user, uh, it's, it works on iOS, iPad, oh, okay. Mac OS. If you are Windows, Linux, or Mac, go for LastPass. LastPass. One password's also on those other platforms at this point. Oh, they are now? Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, not originally on Linux. When yeah, I, I remember that. I was using it when it was back. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I like, I like the Chrome Manager just because it works on my phone, my laptop, my tablet, desktop. Um, I don't have to chase things around as long as I'm logged into Chrome. Hence the vulnerability. <laughs> If you leave yourself logged in somewhere, people can go into your browser and look through your password list, um, which I don't think they can do with a platform like LastPass. Is that correct? That's a little harder to get in and look at your password list, right? You have the master password, you're still free. Yeah. See, you're talking to part-time hackers here, so we're like, yeah, no, I could do that. No. <laughs> Yeah. 
set like how long it caches. Matter of fact, oh, it's on a slide somewhere here about using two-factor. I think it's in my plugin recommendations too. So, yeah, to, uh, I'm seeing a lot of that, especially I mentioned I do a lot of cryptocurrency trading and almost all those platforms use two-factor and Google Authenticator and um, actually, um, Google was pretty good when I logged in here to my Google Drive to get my presentation. Um, it asked me, you know, are you who you are? Look at your phone. And then I clicked yes and my presentation came up. I didn't even have to enter anything. It's pretty cool. Um, a, a, a tip thrown in, use CAPTCHA on things. Um, use CAPTCHA on your login. Um, Actually, ignore the first one there, WP Login reCAPTCHA. I just checked it this afternoon and it hasn't been updated for like three versions of WordPress. Um, but the login, no CAPTCHA reCAPTCHA is simple to use. It adds, you know, the I'm not a robot, so it's one more barrier on your admin login uh, to slow, uh, especially robots down. Um, you will have to, if you implement that, you'll have to go to Google and sign up for a, a reCAPTCHA account and you'll get a key to put in in the plugin when you set it up. Um, software vulnerabilities. Update, update, update. Get on a maintenance program. Many of us have those that sell them. <laughs> uh, we'll do all those for you and fix any problems when they happen. But um, it's just like, I, I mean, if you're a Windows user, right, every Tuesday, get an update. What are most of those? security updates. So all your plugins, your themes, WordPress core, they're constantly getting updates and many of them are security updates so you should keep up with them. Um, don't use pirated software or suspicious free themes. So <laughs> I know I get a lot of especially newbie WordPress users they're out surfing around for free themes. Now if they're in the repository you know when you go into themes and look up through the WordPress repository those are um, should generally be safe, but if you're surfing the web and Googling free themes, um, you, you may get something with a payload in it. Um, uh, could be. Yeah. And I'll log in and immediately I'm not doing any uh, support until they actually either buy Yoast or get the free version. Well, they'll get, they do that because they don't want to pay the, for the premium version of Yoast, but they still come <coughs> for support, which doesn't make any sense because if you buy the plugin anyway, you practically, if you go get support, <laughs> you're getting your money's worth anyway. Yep. You can pay Niall a few hundred dollars to do a few hours of support for you, or you can buy a plugin for thirty dollars and get unlimited. There support. you go. It seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> um, there's also, um, and I, I don't know that any of you are doing this, but you can get most plugins because of our open source community. You probably could even get a few of Pippin's plugins on some site somewhere for five bucks. Uh, and there's a likelihood, um, uh, maybe they're just doing it for the money, uh, but it could have a payload in it. So it could not be Pippin's original plugin. Um, so watch, um, you know, trying to save a buck and buy pirated software. Um, limit your exposure by reducing plugins. Now I'm not a big fan of telling you not to run a ton of plugins on your site. If you're using them and you need them, uh, run them. Um, but um, also be aware, and, and when, I, when I teach about plugins, you know, I kind of talk about how to vet plugins, you know, look at the ratings, how many people are using it. So if you find a plugin out there that happens to do what you're trying to do and for some reason it entices you but it's got like 10 users and you know no ratings and um, <sighs> Pippin you write plugins not all coders that write plugins know anything about security. <laughs> <laughs> they might have written a really nice plugin that has a great big hole to your SQL database in it or something. So, um, every single developer has it somewhere. Yeah. Um, so, it's just the nature of the open source community. You've got a lot of people that um, uh, have not been uh, writing code or even taking a security course and, and know how to write secure code. So, there's no good way to check about that except look at reviews, watch. Uh, so my main source, um, in case I forget to say it later, um, I think I've got it in here in my plugins, but um, uh, I use WordFence um, 
on all my sites uh, and my client sites that I manage. And their website is very good. They have a great blog. They keep up with constantly with everything that's going on, um, not just with WordPress, but across the industry. Um, and identifying vulnerabilities. There was a series of plugins it, this over the past year. I think twice it's happened uh, that were, the plugin developers sold them uh, to someone else, who then proceeded to turn them into malware. Um, and they were still in the WordPress repository at that point. So um, that kind of thing, uh, that kind of news pops up really quick on uh, WordFence's website. Security, another good one, um, to keep up with what's going on and watch for notifications. Uh, remove inactive plugins and themes. We talked about that. Uh, oh, I got this in here twice. Um, disallow file edit true. Um, move your wp-config.php. Um, so I'm not, I'm not big on moving stuff around or changing where your admin login is, that kind of thing, because there's a limited amount of um, uh, protection or advantage to doing that. Um, uh, but moving the wp-config, and people will argue both sides of this uh, ardently. Which side are you on, Pippin? <laughs> Call you out. Depends on the day. Depends on the day, yeah. So wp-config, if you don't know and you're just you know, a moderate or beginner WordPress user, has stored in it um, the username and the password for your database, which is where all your stuff is stored. And so if they get in the database, they can destroy your site, they can steal your client information, pretty much anything they want. Um, so there is merit to moving that where it might be more secure. That's about as deep as I will go. You'll want to kind of Google it, look up the procedure. Basically, you move it up a level, which on your hosting you may not even have access to, um, to, the, to the parent directory. And WordPress still finds it if you do a few more settings. Um, so there's a little machination. So if you really want to get uh, deep and are worried about that, um, I have never, I don't think I've ever run into a problem where that's happened, um, except when uh, somebody set all the file permissions on their server to <laughs> to read that kind of thing. I think the the reason I said that it depends on the name for me uh, is WP config, but also any of the other default locations or files, whether it's one of the folders such as WP content or WP admin or anything like that. While it can work great, keep in mind that the moment you do that, you have changed the default behavior of WordPress. And there are a ton of plugins out there built by every level developer that may or may not know how to account for that. And the thing is, hmm. with, with something like WordPress, is there are thousands of configurations, and plugin developers have a hell of a time accounting for all of those yeah. configurations. So just as a single example, we struggle constantly with easy digital downloads with people that move the locations of WP content or the, the files in there because all of a sudden it breaks our ability to do file discovery yeah. or processing file downloads. Um, so if you do it, just keep in mind that if something breaks, revert it and find out if that's what broke it. Yeah. Because it's a pretty good possibility it will break something. And it's not, to, it's not to say that you moving it is wrong, it's just that there's a lot of plugins that don't know how to account for that. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, there aren't too many, I've only done two technical things because most of the best practices that I'm discussing if you do, you're not going to have an issue. Um, let's see. Uh, don't use the default database prefix WP underscore um, just because it's known and expected and it's just one step closer as robots are iter iteratively trying to guess things like your database name. <coughs> that wouldn't have any effect on functionality anyway, would it? I mean, no. The name. Right. Yeah. Um, don't, don't share database among multiple sites. So I've seen this happen not too often, but people will have four or five WordPress websites um, all um, saving to the same database. So it's just a single point now of vulnerability. If somebody gets into your database from one of the sites, they now have access and can destroy all of your sites. Yeah? Does that include WordPress Well, you can't. I don't think you, you really can't avoid it there. Multi-site usually has different uh, for each table or each. 
each one of the sites. Well, they, right, but they still share a database. Yeah, but it's all in the same database, so. It is possible if you really want to. Yeah. You can, you can put multi-sites in different databases, but it's a little tricky. Yeah. Everything about multi-sites is a little tricky. Is that what Carissa is talking about today? I think Honestly, it might be. Honestly, you shouldn't really be on your host having multiple websites on. And we're, we're going to be really about security. Uh, I feel really bad when I get a person who's had to all 10 of their websites infected on the same C panel and they had to pay <laughs> 800 bucks. Yeah, well, it, yeah, and that's usually because they've got a vulnerability that's common to like a file access vulnerability where they're they're now getting into all the directories so um, yep um, and you could almost say the same thing for shared hosting in a lot of ways um, so hosting <laughs> there we go lead into that shared hosting has more exposure so when when you're on a shared hosting account there may be 500 a thousand other websites on the same server with you um, now, you know, generally those are all pretty well managed because of hacking and things. They do a lot of scanning, a lot of monitoring, um, and the risk is low, but it's there because you're all operating in the same space. Um, VPS, virtual private servers, anybody run their sites on a VPS type account? Okay, so that gives you some more insulation because it's isolated. It may be on the same hardware but it's software isolated to think it's on its own machine so it doesn't communicate with other websites across the machine. Um, so if somebody's site next to you gets hacked and it's trying to infect the other sites on a shared host, it wouldn't happen on a VPS server. Uh, most major hosting companies, <laughs> depending on the day, <laughs> Because <laughs> I do run into streaks with certain hosts. Um, you know, Bluehost is one lately. They have their good months and their bad months where they seem to be, have some vulnerabilities going around. Um, provide very secure and updated environments because it's cheaper for them not to have problems. Um, but look at their environment. So Niall was talking about the earlier um, latest PHP what Linux server are they running, et cetera. So when you get into setting up WordFence, they have a nice firewall now, um, and it'll detect you know, what uh, Linux is running and set up the right firewall for you, that kind of thing. So um, those are important. I've got, I've got a impression tell on clients, but I've got a client right now with a major site, large site, and it's because of a large backend application, um, uh, uh, there's written in Perl. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can't really move it, and, and the site, uh, the server's out of date, um, the Linux version's out of date, uh, who knows what else is out of date, but we can't really um, do it without rewriting the Perl application to be compliant with the latest version of Perl, so we're kind of stuck, and I live in fear every day um, about what could happen. So um, I'll give away my big secret now, how I avoid um, all hacking and vulnerabilities and problems, run a backup. <laughs> so that's, if you take anything away today, and we're going to talk about backups, if you have a backup, um, in most cases, it is possible your site could be infected for months and you don't know it. And, and if you don't have a really old backup, you may not have a, a clean copy. But when the site really goes down hard, you at least have a copy that you can get the site back up, disinfect it, and recover. Um, Security or status blog, so I know the hosting uh, data center that I use, you know, they, they have uh, on their Twitter and they have a website address. You can constantly look and see what the status of the, the, their servers are, whether they have any issues. Um, can you use a, a certificate? Um, do they offer WordPress specific hosting? Um, so I have a, a lot of folks and one of our sponsors, Flywheel, environments like that where they already do all this security monitoring and hardening for you. As a matter of fact, they may not even let you run things like WordFence because they're already doing that monitoring and it conflicts with the monitoring they're doing. So you can get uh, a lot of this protection built into your hosting. Um, who FTPs into their site and all that so, to get access. Yeah, so consider SSH. <coughs> Uh, don't share folders on the website. I see this a lot too. It's more of a legacy thing, but people have had a website a long time and 
maybe they had an HTML site and then they went to WordPress and they've been storing all their pictures in a folder that's open to the public because that's where the, the uh, person on staff was FTPing up photos or what have you. Um, they may have left other folders open for access from the outside. Uh, there it is. Big, do you have a backup? I use Backup Buddy. Um, I've used it for years. Um, works great. There are several good solutions. Um, who uses something else that they like? Mm -hmm. has been well worth the investment. Um, three versions of this have been very fun. I haven't had too many issues on fail because the batch uh, backups that get you uh, uh, when you persist the backup buddy, I've had way too many fails and I just can't do that. It's hmm. a good plugin, but it doesn't work on every single system. Yeah. But you're going to run into that with some other, quite a few plugins. Every managed WordPress host will include auto backups for you as well. Yes, they should be. So, yeah, I basically sell what I call managed WordPress hosting, which is I, I do all that for my clients, and, but part of that process is backing up their site on a schedule. So that's to the next point, which is backup as often as your data changes or you can afford to recover from. So if you're on an e-commerce site and you're doing, you know, 20 sales an hour, um, can you afford not to back up at least every hour? Uh, you know how how much how far back do you want to go back and try and figure out who ordered what or reconstruct your data? Um, you know if you're a blogger, the average blogger blogs twice a year. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know maybe you need two backups a year. So I know I'm guilty of that. Um, store offsite copies. So one of the things I do for every site um, is store three copies. One locally. Not a great idea, but it's convenient. Because if somebody does get into your dashboard, um, they can delete your backups because they have access through the plugin. They actually, and this is behind the push and the pull, and I won't get too deep into push and pull, but um, if you're using Backup Buddy, for instance, and you're storing, I store, um, I actually store backups to two remote places, Google Drive and Amazon S3 storage. Um, but once they're in the dashboard, in the Backup Buddy interface, they can remotely get to those also and delete those backups if they wanted to. Um, so I also store another physical copy that's not related or connected to the site for all my websites. If you're using cPanel, if you have a host that has using cPanel, and depending on your host's rental service, you have to be careful if you want to use the cPanel backup, because you can have a You have to download it and then get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, all of a sudden you just you get you are suspended. Yeah, it depends. <coughs> depends on two things: how much file space they give you, and sometimes, but not so much with a backup, unless you're storing all the discrete files. How many files you can store? So, uh, Backup Buddy does a big zip file, so it's only really one one file. Um, Schedule them, automate them. Uh, all the backup softwares have automation in them. So if you know once a week is a great time to back up, set a schedule, set it and forget it. Uh, you can set even the pushes to remote locations, have it email you the zip file, all that, all that stuff. Um, security plugins. So here's my plugin list. You got to have those. It's a WordPress convention, right? Um, so there's a, a couple of different types of security plugins. Uh, monitoring and scanning. So that's just really monitoring your site. Um, against uh, things that people might be trying um, and scanning it for things that have already happened to it. Um, so WP scan, the Google Search Console actually checks because if you've been infected long enough to have your site have the big red Google warning that says don't visit this site, it's unsecure and it's infected, um, that's no good. That takes a long time though. Um, Jetpack Protect, Securi, WordFence, um, they all have scanning um, and monitoring. Um, WordFence may send too many notifications. <laughs> Every time you do a, uh, a WordPress update even, it says your core files have changed and then your client gets that too because they've got an admin account and they're like, 
What's wrong? Am I hacked? No, no. We're just we're just watching. Uh, defense. Um, so these plugins all have active defenses against what's going on. Vault Press, WordFence, iTheme Security, uh, All in One WP, Google Authenticator, Clef Two Factor Authentication. Although I'm not sure that one still. Somebody told me that may still not be available. Um, bulletproof Security, um, but don't install all of them. <laughs> uh, one, your site's going to be scanning all the time. It could affect the performance, but they also may interact with each other poorly. Um, find one good one. I mean, a couple of the top ones on there, WordFence, iTheme Security. Um, there is, let me look at my next slide. Yeah, I've got it on the next slide. Um, another one that I'll mention. Uh, but pick a good one. Um, one like WordFence is going to cover monitoring and defense both. And WordFence includes a firewall. Um, remediation and cleanup. Um, so we won't go through, because we only have about five minutes, but <laughs> the depth of what to do once your site goes down, has been hacked, and how you recover. Um, number one, get out your backup. Just wipe it out and restore. Uh, well, you may not even wipe it out. I, I, I'm such a, a safety nut <laughs> and don't want to have to go back and reconstruct anything that I'll usually download. Um, all the files, even if they're infected, the database and everything, store it away. Do a restore, just in case you got a bad backup or who knows what. Um, you at least have something that you could clean up later the hard way. Um, wipe the environment clean, including a new database uh, when you restore. Um, usually when you restore to the, the existing database, it's going to overwrite everything, but you never know. Um, I've also run into a few situations where um, the malware's left cron jobs that a week later come up and reinfect your site. <laughs> so you want to start from scratch. Um, don't have a backup? You're going to have to review every file or replace everything you can with new copies. So uh, we won't go through that process, but you kind of start by replacing all the WordPress core files and looking through the directories to see for s stuff that shouldn't be there. Um, it's a pretty laborious process. I'd say manually cleaning a site takes me an average of 15 hours. Um, at um, I suppose if you're managing your own server, maybe OS cron jobs, but um, any comments? Unless you have offloaded them to yeah. your server. To the server. The the, okay, yeah. Um, I knew we had a techie, though, back there. He might be running his own server. <laughs> uh, back in the day, I would have done that. It's too much trouble now. Um, let's see. Change all your passwords and your salts again. Um, one, I've had really good luck with Eli Anti-Malware Security. Is anybody using that or tried it? Uh, it's a plug-in. It's in the repository. Um, if your site is not completely down and you can run that plug-in, it actually does a very good scan and remediation. Um, you're still going to want to do some third-party checks against your site again from the people like Security and just use three or four tools to make sure it got cleaned up. Uh, but I've had really good luck with uh, with that one, cleaning stuff up. I had never either. I don't know what the Eli is. Um, Eli, anti-malware security. Um, Security, if you uh, Google Security Free Scan, they have a free scan on the web. They'll scan your site. It's somewhat accurate. It's, it, they don't deep deep scan, but it'll give you an idea. If you think something's funky, you know, go do their free scan and see uh, if they return a bad result. Um, check your cron jobs. Questions? We have still got about five minutes. If you want to. So it is possible that any of those external or internal will can can and maybe at times will uh, miss a lot of, for example, content injections. Sometimes even security will miss SEO spam. Um, so or content injections as in uh, a line of JavaScript that may randomly uh, 
send you to some inappropriate website. Uh, so sometimes in that instance, you may have to check your con actual content if you're not if you're not comfortable checking database for some of these things to see if it actually is there. Or for example, checking a lot of very common header.php of your of your theme and your footer.php of your theme. Very very two common mm. most common places I see for this type of these type of infections that are actually missed. And then the third one I always look for the content exactly for those. But there are other ways to be where it will be in the database, but you have to really find it. You have to know what code it is. Yeah, I kind of cruised by it, but yeah, you might Google and look up you know the WP scan for WordPress. It's a black box tool outside of you know running it on your site that'll actually scan the site. And um, it's a little more techy to run it. You gotta download it install it, run it. Um, but it'll do a deeper scan than um, a, a lot of the plugins will. Any, anything else? I was sure that um, it might be worthwhile to change the admin. There's a little bit the database. Can you do that on the The admin user number. number. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's... No, this is a thing. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, just for funsies, uh, we had a bug that yours truly once by accident <laughs> that accidentally gave me admin access to Yoast.com uh, by clicking the interface. Um, that was pretty fun. Wow. So the reason that happened is because your default user ID defaults to one. Um, well, if your code is set up improperly and you have some bugs in your code and you do some validation of numbers and you use a particular <coughs> function called an absolute value, let's just imagine for a moment that you pass negative one to absolute value. What do you get back? One. one. Well, if you just happen to have more bugs in your code that then says when I have a valid user ID, <laughs> go ahead and log me in, bad things happen. So the problem with negative one is that if you have a bug in your code, that accidentally processes a login attempt when it shouldn't, you can actually re get a login account for whatever user account is number one. Um, and so the idea behind what you're saying is change, don't, like, just delete user ID number one. Mm -hmm. Because if there is a bug like that, then it won't happen as likely. It's not okay. as likely to happen. Yeah, that gets that gets on my list of obscure things that I was that I avoided in my presentation, but they can happen. It's kind of like changing the path of your login and stuff like that. It's, it's, a, it's it, a real thing. Yeah, they they're all real things. I mean, <laughs> it can all happen. Uh, but go home, back up your site, <laughs> and uh, when it goes down, just restore it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>